Hey skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com up here on a beautiful spring day at Stowe and I am on the Rustler 9. Uh, we talked about these things way back in the winter, I want to say January, kind of introduced the whole line and we mentioned that we would do a, a more in-depth, at least Rustler 9 review. Uh, I think we'll get to the 10 as well and probably the Shiva 9 and 10 too. But yeah, I've been having a lot of fun kind of putting these through a more thorough test, a bunch of different snow conditions, moved the mount point a little bit. Some people were asking about that and park capabilities, so did a little bit of park skiing on them, not too much. And we got a what's looking like a really soft Perry Merrill run here, so I'm going to do that. We'll meet you back in the studio. We'll talk more about Rustler 9s. Hey skiers, here we are back in the studio. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking about this one. I think a lot of people are excited about hearing about it too. It's definitely a two-way street. Yeah, we probably maybe got more questions about this than any other ski this year. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah, I would say it's arguably like some of the biggest ski advancement news of this upcoming year. Yeah, our biggest line change, yeah. collection change. Yep. Yeah, I think that's fair. At least if it's not the most significant, it's in the top five right easily yep um so here it is this is the rustler nine we've got the previous Rus rustler nine right there bob's also got the new 11 behind him i've got the shiva nine here we did that video back in early january kind of talking about the whole collection um and it, it feels like we've been on like a season-long journey since then i mean obviously yep. we've skied other stuff too but just if you add up all the different places we've skied this thing and all the different scenarios, like we've done a lot on a Rustler 9. It's pretty thorough. I think we've given it a pretty thorough run through. Yeah, I think so too. So as a refresher, we'll, uh, we'll do a little bit on construction here. Bob, I'm sure you're going to nail it on okay. construction and there's a lot to talk about with this one, isn't there? Yeah, we finally get um, the more sophisticated true blend wood core in these rustler skis i think we were yep. kind of expecting it maybe last year with that but hustle yeah. got it instead right. yeah um, we were so, kind of anticipating it i think yeah. that's fair and i think that that was i think that served them well putting it in hustle as kind of a dry run for sure. what we're seeing here with uh, new rustler nine so they actually used that same uh, true blend wood core as hustle skis do so they're true blend free ride uh, we got poplar, um, polonia, and beech wood stringers in here. Uh, so definitely has that lighter weight feel that the that we really like about the hustle, um, but also still has that nice and stable uh, denser woods in the beech and the poplar. Good time to touch on weight, just under 2,000 sure. grams here in this 180 centimeter length. Yep, so I think it's like 1935 or something like that. They always fluctuate a few. Which, consider, considering the amount of metal in it, I think is commendable. Right. Um, so that's the next step here is this metal laminate. So Jeff's got the that old antiquated Rustler 9. That is, Dynamic release technology, yeah, just getting I mean, thrown right out the window. Gone. Um, you know, that ski uses the metal underfoot full width and then tapers to the middle. 
uh, towards the tips and tails. Uh, this new rustler takes that in the opposite direction. We still have that full width underfoot laminate, and then we have this more forked or pronged, kind of a half of a frame technique. So if you think about like kendo or mantra from, uh, from vocal, it's a similar type of frame. They do not run it full way through the tip or the tail. Uh, that gives it a very unique you know, personality and character that we yep. can touch on with performance. I really liked your tuning fork analogy. Right, and I think that was, that's kind of the goal here is that it really kind of adjusts that torsional flex yeah. and uh, you know, the ability to access the side cut of this ski, which really comes through on snow. Yeah. Um, but we do have that uh, fr frame style metal laminate in the tip and all the way through the tail here. So again, doesn't go full width or full length all the way around, uh, rather stops and that is with purpose. I feel like I need to uh, satisfy our friends over at Blizzard and, and say, what the flux is that is that called? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can call it whatever you want. Flux form. They call it flux form. Um, and that's just kind of a fun way of saying this is our new and improved technology going yep. into this ski. Yep. Um, metal underfoot too? Yeah, full know. Yeah, full width metal underfoot. Yeah. So I was looking at it right Two before. Two different pieces though, it's not a single piece. Right, it's it's three different. Correct. One, two, three, four, yes. five. Um, so separate pieces. Um, and yeah, that metal underfoot is about from my fingers to fingers. Uh, you know, on that 188 that Jeff has over there, it's a little bit further uh, fore and aft with that full metal. So the metal in this new nine is the full width is a little bit smaller. Sure. So yeah, more... but I think overall, I mean, actually, I don't know, that would be interesting to try and measure and yeah. calculate the surface area, but it feels like there's more metal in that ski. Ultimately, that's kind of what the, the character of the ski yeah. shows. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I think that's pretty much it on construction, right, Bob? Yeah, it's a little bit simpler than, uh, than that, which had different carbon laminates and stuff like that. So Yeah, unidirectional carbon fiber, yeah. stuff like that. Right. Sure. This one's a little bit more simplistic in nature, and I think that that kind of Although the metal it. application is more uh, complex. Yeah, that's more technologically yeah. advanced, for sure. Now, before we um, finish with construction, I thought this was really interesting, and this is going to come up 100% when we talk about performance and application and all that stuff. Um, this ski, as a reminder, is pretty <laughs> stiff. Yeah, this thing and is... And this is a 188, which, yeah. like, sometimes the longer you go, the softer it can actually feel, like, hand flexing it. Right. Like, that's a pretty stiff ski, and then... This one's considerably rounder in yeah. that flex. Yeah, and maybe mostly in the tail, which I always think it's a bummer that they can't see the tail flexing against the ground, but, right. like, there's a lot of flex in the tail, which is pretty cool. So it's, like, a kind of a, an interesting concept here where they softened the longitudinal flex yep. while increasing torsional stiffness. And that you know, like we've said so far, that shines through in how this ski interacts with the snow and the skier. 100%. Yeah. And I, like, I've mentioned that before as just a characteristic about a ski that I personally really like. Yeah. Like, I'm not super heavy. I like when I can bend a ski more easily without it feeling washy. Right. And it's like, I was trying to think of the ski that we, like, had that specific conversation about and it is very different but i was thinking back to the k2 reckoner 102 sure which is like again it, it is different like that ski is considerably softer it's like kind of exaggerating that and this has more torsional stiffness but it's a, at least a similar concept and both have been specifically engineered to correct have torsional flex correct be a, a big part of that ski it's the field. goal and the idea yeah. of both both skis correct Yep. While, while they are doing it differently. Um, so I thought that was interesting with construction. And then from a shaping perspective, we'll just take a quick look at this shape here. And then I had some, I, I wanted to just measure a few things on this ski compared to that ski, yep. just to make sure it kind of, that the data at least was supporting what I was feeling, which it is kind of nice when you get to get a little bit of a, Validation. Yeah, validation it's, is wonderful. Yeah, it's totally. nice. So a lot of tip rocker in this ski. Um, they've basically 
increase the amount of both tip and tail rocker. So tip rocker starts right there where my hand is. Um, we got some studio shots too that'll probably show this a little bit closer. And then tail rocker, we got a good amount of tail rocker back here. There is still camber in the ski. This thing's, this was a demo ski for Blizzard. This thing's been put through the ringer at right. this point. Um, but there is a considerable amount of camber in it. You, you still feel the, the pushback of the camber oh, totally. a little bit. And then I brought a notebook. I don't, don't normally have to refer to notes, <laughs> but there was just so much going on that I thought this was important, and I know that people will be interested in it. And sometimes this information is hard to find. Yeah. Our friends at Sooth Ski do a good job, but they have yet to gotten their, get, got their hands on this right. ski. So anyways, the new ski, by my measurement, has 38 centimeters of tip rocker, 33 centimeters of tail rocker, and 10 centimeters of tail splay. The old ski, that one over there, has 35 centimeters of tip rocker, 28 centimeters of tail rocker, and eight centimeters of tail splay. So a couple things there. There, if you're comparing the length of tip rocker to tail rocker, yeah. there is a seven centimeter difference between tip and tail rocker length in that ski and there's a five centimeter difference in this ski. Yeah. So it's like the rocker shape is a little bit more balanced, yeah. I guess. Less, or symmetrical almost. Sure, less, it's leaning more symmetrical, yeah. less directional. Yeah. That is where those differences end. There is still a 10.5 millimeter difference between tip and tail width. Yeah. So I think that's pretty important. Totally. And mount point on both skis is eight centimeters back from true center. So when skiing it, this did feel more symmetrical as a whole entity. Yeah. And I wasn't sure where exactly that was coming from. And it's definitely coming from the increase in tail rocker length. Right. So I thought that was interesting. Makes sense. Got, had to get technical <laughs> for a second there. Um, and I think that's it for construction and shape. So we can move right into the fun stuff and talk performance. Yep. I'd like to start with groomers, um, mostly because we normally do, but also because back in that, that January, early January Rustler Shiva video, I hadn't like really been able to push it too hard on a groomer. So we kind of deferred to your thoughts a lot. Yep. Um, and I'm interested to hear if your thoughts have changed, but rewatching, going back and rewatching that video, you kind of mentioned specifically like high speed GS turns and yep. how the ski didn't love that. And I'm, I'm curious if that still remains true for you because I have my own thoughts on how that, yeah. that feels. Uh, two, I would say I have two updates on that. Perfect. One is that I still haven't gotten on the 186. Yep, which I think is important. Yep. So still, it's me on the 180. Yep. Uh, pushing a little bit past the length. Yep. Uh, two, I've gotten it on firmer snow since then. Yep. Uh, have not found, I guess I would say like, and again, length plays a part in this, but on those firmer groomer days, when you're pushing it hard, when I'm pushing it hard. Yep. Uh, I can definitely make that thing chatter. Cool. So okay. there's, and I will say that getting on the 188 in this previous Rustler 9, that wasn't so much the case. Yeah, which I think would happen in the 186 here most yeah, likely. Yeah, I, I think that I think that that length will solve that issue. And again, it is jamming on the edge right. at a high speed on hard snow. Right. You're, like, you're really talking pushing it hard. Yeah. That's yeah. not an everyday thing. In terms of the everyday skiing on groomers, I still feel like this thing is very happy in that mid range. Yep. Is if you get going faster than what I, what, you know, my height to weight ratio on that length ski, yep. then it's going to start doing things that I don't want it to do. Which is a, if we're talking limitations, like not, that's not something that that many people are going to reach. Totally. And it totally changes for me. Yeah. Like at my size, you know, take, take 60 pounds off the skier weight. Yeah. I never once found a, a flinch point for yep. this ski, so to speak. 
every once in a while, like my own skiing kind of got a little messy and like, yeah, that, I didn't make a perfect turn, but I loved how hard you can push this yep. thing on a groomer. And it, to be honest, kind of surprised me. I felt like I could ski it harder than that ski by quite a bit. And going back to that, that early January video that we did, like we talked a little bit about how the Blizzard guys were talking about how strong it was and maybe the snow conditions didn't like allow us to really like access that strength. Yeah. I've like, I totally know what they're talking about now. Thing absolutely rips when you want it to yep. and makes those like really, really round, clean carving turns. Like similar to how I feel when I'm skiing uh, Nordica Unleashed 98. I find that they have like similar characteristics in how they carve. Just very, very round, very fun, very clean yeah. turns. Um, so I thought that was sweet. And again, going back to that like longitudinal flex pattern, I always find that it really, really helps somebody my weight or I don't even know if it's weight dependent. I think it just helps in general. I think there's a lot to that concept of having good torsional stiffness but a softer longitudinal flex because it it gives you these like deep yep. trenchy very rewarding turns super high edge angle your body's getting low to the ground just so fun i will say that they they don't feel like tremendously snappy for me coming out of a turn but that's not that's also not what i would expect out of this shape kind of like when yeah. you have that much rocker especially in the tail like yeah you're not gonna get like shot out of a carving turn for me they kind of just like they roll really easily yeah. from turn to turn which I really like I think it's like a intuitive kind of confidence inspiring or, or somewhat forgiving feel for for linking carving turns is you don't have to like manage this like crazy lateral energy you're kind of like dictating yeah how much energy you want the ski to to give you out of a turn so i thought that was sweet yeah totally so pretty interesting mm -hmm. you know i think hearing your thoughts compared to my thoughts i think the length plays a lot into that but i you know i think that's important for people to consider is if like if you're your size and you're shopping for a ski with the idea that you're going to be just railing high speed turns on a groomer, that skier might still be better off with a bona fide 97. Right. And that's totally fine. Where like, for me, I appreciate the ability and the, the accomplishments of the bona fide, but it's like so strong that it's like, there's, there are like two, two total things I can do on it. And that's it. Right. Where this, like, I can ski it really, really hard still, but then there's so many other things I can do on it. Yeah, and it's interesting you had mentioned the Unleashed. And as you were talking, I was thinking, like, my comparison would be, like, QST from Solomon. So this almost felt more like the 92. And, and this feels like the 98. That feels like the 98. Yeah, that and makes sense a, to and me. And that's a difference uh, that has come about recently. Um, so a little bit extra width, more rocker yeah. in the new nine, you know, that really kind of makes it feel like it's capable of those rounder, higher edge angle turns, whereas that QST 92, a little bit more snappy, a yep. uh, little bit more of that finishing pop, which I found fit better with this one, uh, especially given that stiffer longitudinal flex. Yep. So I agree with interesting that. how these skis change and then they kind of change your uh, opinions of relative comparisons. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think like we may have just skipped over that when we were talking about shape. But if you don't, if you aren't already aware, yeah, this ski is ninety six underfoot now. Yeah. Where that ski was ninety four in the long lengths or ninety two and yep. pretty much all the others. So yeah, it, it is. It, it's interesting, and I think we talked about that in the that past video that we did too. It, it is moving. It's shifting where it falls in the the grand scheme of things and the whole on all the yeah. skis in the world it is moving more towards that like narrow free ride yep. category which i think is perfectly fair um now it's kind of interesting because that ski used that term dynamic release technology totally, yeah. could have just carried it right over to this <laughs> thing because edge release is off the charts yeah. i think especially for a ski with metal yep um you know i never felt 
I never felt like it was hard to dump a bunch of speed. It's never hard to make little short turns on the side of the trail. Um, and I think that's really nice to have. I think it opens up, it not only allows you to make different turns and, and ski different terrain and just kind of put your own, your own personal signature on what you're doing, it also means that it's more approachable for a lower level skier. Yeah. You know, when you're totally locked in like that, um, like you are on, say, a bona fide, then it's like, that's like a bad choice, like objectively right. a bad choice for a developing skier, where this could be great. Like you, you've already, you've built some technique, you have a reasonably strong skiing foundation, you're looking to get to the next level without a ski that's going to punish you, great ski. Yeah. It's forgiving enough. Right. Without being punishing or too demanding. Right. So it really strikes that nice balance. And we kind of talked about it, you know, the term sophisticated. Yep. You know, or, you know, more poised. And I think that that really applies to this new model. And that really benefits skiers that maybe didn't or don't want something that could be considered more jittery. Like right. this stiffer version. Yeah. yeah. I think jittery. Jittery is a good word. Yeah. Like that, that ski does feel a little jittery in a bunch of different applications. Yeah. And I think that that kind of short skidded turn, like the feel of doing that crosses over 100% into off-piece terrain, into trees, into moguls, into yeah. stuff like that. Like that ski did feel, it was, and we, this word came up a lot the last time we talked about these skis, that to me felt less consistent in how yeah. it was interacting with the snow surface which when you're in variable conditions, like Vermont trees, can be a little bit weird because it'll like catch and grab in spots, it'll bounce you off in spots. Um, it can be a little bit unpredictable mm -hmm. where this ski in skiing off-piste terrain, I at least thought felt more consistent and more predictable while still being very easy to release the edge and get it to wiggle. Yeah. Yeah, more intuitive, and I think that that kind of also follows that QST comparison, where it's like yeah. you don't have to think about it. It goes, yeah, it goes where you think it should go. Totally, like you ba basically don't even have to move it. Yeah, it's yeah, it really does. Yeah, it makes you feel like you're in complete control. Um, and we didn't ski it in like tremendously deep snow, or maybe you did, and we didn't film it. Yeah, I know you had a lot of non-filmed days. Yeah, on no, I, snuck out, I snuck out on that thing quite a bit. But I felt like um, I felt like it was noticeably easier in softer snow for me than that ski. And I think that a lot of that had to do with the increase in tail rise. Yeah. So I skied that in the, I would say, the densest snow day of the year. You know, four or five inches yeah. followed by rain. Okay. And when it's fresh, like it's really fun. Yep. And you can just stay on top for all intents and purposes. It's bottomless. Yeah. Just like you're not. Around. Yeah, you're yeah. not coming close to even the middle of that, of that fresh snow. Yep. And the tip rocker, tail rocker, that even flex made it really, really fun. Yep. You know, we've skied on some smeary skis lately here in the spring. Yep. I would put that right up there in terms of that really dense. You know, it's the closest thing we get to like Sierra cement. Yeah. You know, right. when it's Heavy. fresh, it's yeah. it's fine. Once it gets cut through a few times, it's really really challenging. But you know, you seek out that untracked stuff on that ski, and it's super easy. Really really fun. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's it's great, and it like, I think what happens a lot when you ski those those smeary skis is they they don't often have like the benefits and characteristics of metal too. Right. So this ski strikes a nice balance between kind of all of those different things. Yeah, no, totally. Um, anything else you want to talk about off piece characteristics, Bob? Uh, other than the fact that it was a joy to ski in the trees, like, yeah. no, like it's, it's swivelly in the moguls. Like, you know, it's, I think that that the more dramatic tail splay, Makes it a little bit wonky in the bumps, like tighter bumps. Okay, yeah. Um, but anything other than that is fine. You know, trees is super easy. Again, it's kind of that just ability for the ski to go where it's pointed. Yeah. You know, we got those tighter trees here. It's easy to make those subsequent turns. Um, they're not near. They're not too stiff for moguls remotely. No. You know, like I skied more moguls. I would say on the Rustler Ten. I actually thought this was like. 
a useful tool for me and the moguls because it has, it's got plenty of smeariness. Yeah. And then it's also not like too reactive. Like, and you yeah. know that, that like my problem in the moguls is I'll get late. Yeah. And like on a stiffer ski, when you get late, you kind of get punished. Where this, I felt like I could be quick enough with my feet that I could catch back up. So that was yeah. like just a nice characteristic, I thought. We've been having kind of that, the wider short snow blade discussion lately with some of the skis we've been on. And for me and the moguls, Why, I they, had that feeling. Yeah, that makes like, sense. That's not... It's not my favorite, but totally, I see what you're saying. Yeah, like, for me, it's, like, super it's perfect. Yeah, because yeah. I don't need, like, you know, you talk a lot about, like, driving the tip down right. the back of the mogul, and I'm like, oh. That's where this thing's like, great. Probably yeah. not going to ever do that, or at least, like, that's not, yeah. I don't know. I don't find myself improving drastically in my mogul skiing year over year. So I think, like, right. for me, a ski like this is, that's, that's kind of the ticket. Yeah. Pretty sweet. Um, now... A lot of people were asking kind of about park park application, and that that's a conversation that we had on those. Yep. And I think entering into a conversation like this, it's important to remember that the conversation has always been that park should be like a fringe application for this ski. If right. you're splitting your time 50-50 between the rest of the mountain and the park, there are better skis. Like, no one's going to be mad right. at me saying that um, if you spend 20 percent of your time in the park or if you're like interested in the park or if you're 37 like me and you used to ski in the park and now you do less but you still like to go in there sometimes i do think it would work if you go back to that concept of it is more symmetrical from a rocker perspective that helps a lot and i think the increase in tail splay also helps mm -hmm. a lot in the park, I skied them, um, or at least when we were doing park testing, I bumped the bindings up about three centimeters. Uh, didn't measure exactly, uh, it was more just shifting the demo binding, but it should be just about three yeah. centimeters exactly, which is still five centimeters back from true center. Um, but I actually thought it felt pretty darn balanced. I wasn't like sliding a bunch of rails on them because the ski doesn't belong to me. I think I did slide some boxes, so hopefully uh, Dave and Adam. They seem fine. Yeah, they'll they be seem fine. fine. You can forgive me for doing that. Um, but no, I thought it was great. Like it's every basically every characteristic about it that is a benefit in off-piste use also carries over to the park. So very smeary, never catchy. Um, it's very like. I don't know that forgiving is the right word, but smooth. Yeah. So on landings with the softer pro flex pattern and, and the kind of damp properties of metal, it like you sink into the landing more where that ski you didn't like, you didn't necessarily have that same feel. Again, it was like a little more jittery yeah. where this ski is, is smoother. Um, skis switch really well. Like I, it's like, very similar to the Unleashed again in the sense that I like doing like higher speed 180s on it and stuff like that. Thought it was really fun. Did some 360s, did some 540s on it, and it works just fine. Yep. Um, it does feel, again, it's not the heaviest ski in the world, but it does, you feel the weight on your feet. Like a lot of park skis are a little bit lighter than this. Um, so I think it's, it's still not the best choice for somebody who has like really specific demands in the park. Uh, but if you're just going in there to have some fun from time to time, I think it's a perfectly yeah. reasonable choice. I mean, if you think of some other twin tips in that range, like Poacher, you know, K2 Poacher, Armada, ARV 96. range. Yeah, Volcal Revolt 95. They're all hovering around 2,000 grams in this, yeah, that's true. In this length. Um, Maybe like Bents or... Yeah, something like, like you kind of have to try to find a lighter ski. I mean, new ARV is probably. Right. Not to let the cat out of the bag, but there are a lot of lighter options yep. out there. And if you think about the skis that I've been skiing in the park this year, yep. Playmakers, new ARVs, they're all pretty, they're pretty light. light. So I think that's kind of where the, where the experience was coming from yep. for me. But I think it's per perfectly reasonable. I think if you wanted to buy this ski and mount it plus three, I think you could do that just fine. Um, 
I think most people, and I put this in the written article, um, my general rule of thumb for Mount Point is if you're not 100% sure making that decision on your own based on like anecdotal experience that you have, you probably don't need to move it. Right. And like maybe some people don't won't like that I say that, but like I say that all the time. <laughs> there needs to be a, a reason. Yeah. And like these engineers know what they're doing. And right. most people that are skiing this ski should just mount it right on the recommended mount point. If you're still skiing park 10% of the time, that's fine. As yeah. long as you're not doing like basically rails. Right. Like then there's kind of no reason to move it or like spins over 900 or something. Like I don't know exactly where you'd make the cutoff there, but I don't think too many people should move the mount point. And if you're spinning 900s, then you will likely have that answered for yourself. Right. Then you fall into yeah. the category of like, yeah, you're not going to ask. Right. You're going to do whatever you have decided works best for you. Um, but kind of keeping in the twin tip park theme here, Blizzard has, I don't want to say neglected that category, but for lack of a better word, we'll say neglected. Okay. Like they had gun smokes yep. and peacemakers and whatever the third the, one the was. The narrower one, I, I can't remember the name of that thing. Um, either, and they there, were great. there were a lot of people that really liked those skis. Yep. Um, our Regulator. Co Regulator, thank you, that was the narrower one. Yep. Um, our coworker, Matt McGinnis, who writes Top 5 Fridays articles and, and does a bunch of other cool stuff for us, he was one of those skiers. And he was like legitimately sad yep. when they got rid of those ski skis excuse me, and he's skiing on a Rustler 10 now. Right. So I think it's cool that they're at least, they have built a ski that speaks to that audience a little bit better. And I think you'll see it. I think you'll see it in like Freeride World sure. Tour stuff, yep. like probably not on the nine, but I think you'll see more skiing on Rustlers with freestyle influence than you did on previous Rustlers. Yeah. Yeah, so I you'll think see it's cool. a lot of this. Totally. Doing tricks in the backcountry. And, and the mountains. 10, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's it. Yeah. Wrestler 9, great conversation. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, Feels like we've been talking for a really long time. I have no since idea how long. Since January? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This video is three months yeah. long. No, I think we've covered it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, questions are... Comparisons are yep. always always warranted. Yep, and we could have talked about the Shiva here, but I'm going to leave that for Emily because yep. Emily's skied a bunch, and she has had a, a really favorable opinion of it. Um, so I'm excited to hear her thoughts. Yep, totally. So let us know if you have any Rustler 9 questions. Happy to like do any wild measuring or whatever that people might want me to do. I feel like I've already done that, but maybe I missed something. No, you might get some really obscure... <laughs> requests can you, right can you measure like the distance between yeah. the blizzard logos yeah exactly i will not be doing that um so yeah let us know if you have any legitimate questions about the new rustler skis and we will talk to you soon bye